Hi, and welcome to Profdale's Property video number 10. The subject of this video is class gifts. We need to begin by talking about what we mean by a class gift. And the definition of a class gift is it's a gift to a group of people who are described not by their individual names, but by their relationship. In other words, we're describing them generically rather than individually. Typical examples would be my children or your children, Amy's heirs, Fred's issue. These are all classes of people described by their relationship rather than by name. If we said to my children, John and Mary, even though there are two of them and therefore they're a group, that wouldn't be a class gift because we've given their names. A class gift can be given either by way of a remainder or an executory interest. Either will work. Let's take an example of a class gift to A for life, then to A's children. Assume that A has no children at the time of the gift. Is the remainder void or has it failed? No, not at all, because it's a future interest. It doesn't take possession until A dies and therefore we have some time for A to have some children to become the holders of the future interest. They don't need to take possession until after the death of A. Suppose A dies without ever having any children. Is the remainder void or failed? Well, the answer is that it's failed. There won't ever be any people who fit the definition A's children, and therefore the remainder has failed. By the way, if A is male, we do need to wait nine months after A's death to find out if A has any posthumous children. If there are any, they qualify and they can take the remainder. Let's assume that after the gift is made, A has one child. Who owns the remainder now? Obviously, that child does. And at this point, that child is the sole holder of the remainder. But if A has a second child, who owns the remainder now? Well, now it's split between the two of them. They both fit the definition A's child. Here's a graphical representation of the principle on the previous slide. Let's assume the gift is to A for life and then to A's children. And if A has children, we'll see who owns the remainder. Let's assume that A has one child. Obviously, that child holds a 100% interest in the remainder. But what happens if another child is born? Child two will be born and take a 50% interest in the remainder, and child one's interest will be cut back from 100% to 50%. So each of them then has an equal 50% share of the remainder. There's a name for this phenomenon. We call this class gift a remainder that's subject to open or subject to partial defeasance. And the idea is that each owner is subject to having their interest reduced, not destroyed, but reduced in fractional size as additional children are born. Now remember not to read conditions of survival into a class gift if there are none there. Is there a difference between these two conveyances, to A for life, then to A's children, and to A for life, then to A's surviving children? And when we say surviving children, pretty obviously, we mean the children of A who outlive or who survive A. Well, in the first example, a child only needs to be born to A in order to qualify for the gift. Every child that is born is entitled to a share of the remainder. In the second example, in order to qualify for the remainder, the child not only has to be born, but has to outlive A. So there's a huge difference between the two, even though there's only one tiny word separating them, the word surviving. The point to remember is not to read in a condition of survival if the grantor didn't express one. Let's assume that A has two children, child one and child two, as we talked about before, and each of them has a 50% interest in the remainder. Now, let's suppose that child one dies before A does. What happens to child one's interest in the remainder? If A dies, in other words, who actually gets the land? 
Well, the answer, of course, is that if child one dies, child one's share will go to child one's successors. They might be child one's heirs or child one's devisees in theory. Notice that we're only talking about disposing of the 50% that child one owned. Is child one likely to have a will? Well, if child one is still a minor, child one doesn't have the capacity to execute a will. And so let's assume that child one doesn't have a will. Who are child one's heirs by intestate succession likely to be? Well, once again, if child one is a minor, chances are child one doesn't have any children or any spouse. And therefore, the heirs of child one are likely to be child one's surviving parents or possibly grandparents, or possibly, if there are no grandparents or parents surviving, some collateral relatives, such as aunts and uncles or nieces and nephews. The point is that child one's heirs are going to get the 50% that child one owned. Now we're going to change the question a little and talk about to A for life, then to A's surviving children. Once again, we'll assume that A has two children, child one and child two, each of them owns a 50% interest in the remainder. Now let's assume that child one dies before A dies. Then when A dies, who gets the land? In other words, what happens to child one's 50% share? Well, the answer, of course, is that in this case, because child one has to survive A in order to qualify for the remainder, the remainder will fail because that condition of survivorship is not met with regard to child one's 50%. So child one's 50% interest is canceled out. It's not destroyed, literally, it fails. And child two's interest becomes 100%. The result is that child two will get the entire land. Now let's take a look at an example in which the class gift is to a person's heirs. Remember, heirs means the people who are entitled to take a person's real estate if that person dies without a will. And the heirs are determined by an intestate succession statute. Every state has one that tells which of your surviving relatives will take your real estate if you die without a will. So the example says to A for life, then to B's heirs, we're going to assume that B is a living person. So who are B's heirs? Well, the answer, of course, is we can't tell. We can't ever identify anybody's heirs until that person has died. And if B's alive, B's heirs are unascertainable. So when can B's heirs be ascertained? Only at the moment of B's death. At that time, we can look around, see which of B's relatives survived B, and therefore which ones are entitled to claim to be B's heirs. Now, let's suppose that A dies and B is still living. Well, we can't give the property to B's heirs yet because we can't tell who they're going to be. So what happens to the land? The answer is there will be a reversion in the grantor. I like to call this a temporary reversion because the grantor may not get to keep the land indefinitely, but at least for the moment, we're going to let the land go back to the grantor. Suppose later B dies. What happens to the land then? Well, now we can ascertain or identify B's heirs, and therefore they're entitled to the property. By the way, you'll remember there was an old common law rule called the doctrine of destructibility of contingent remainders, and it said that if a remainder wasn't ready to take when the prior estate ended, it would be destroyed. But that rule of destructibility has been repealed or done away with in nearly all American states. So we don't need to worry about that. And therefore, the heirs of B are entitled to take the land, even though they were not yet qualified, in fact, not even identifiable at the time A died. They'll get it later. Now, here's one final example. It says to A for life, then to B's children. Let's assume that B is a living person and has two children. Now A dies. Could B have any more children? Well, of course, B is still living and anyone can have children as long as they live. By the way, you might say that's a silly statement. You might say, wait a minute, what if B had a vasectomy or a hysterectomy? 
What if B is 99 years old? Obviously, there are situations in which B can't have any more children. But the common law always assumed, presumed really, that B could have children as long as B lived. And today, that assumption makes even more sense than it used to because today, B could have children by adoption and they would count. And anyone, no matter how old they are, no matter what their biological condition, can have children by adoption. So it does make sense to say that B could have more children, no matter what B's medical condition or age might be. B can have more children. However, if there are any members of this class in being at the time A dies, we close the class when we are ready to distribute possession of the land to the class members. When does the class get possession? When A dies in this example. So when A dies, we say, however member, many members of the class exist, however many children B has, they get the property and nobody else who is born in the future can take any share of it. The class is considered closed at that point. This is a rule of construction. Any later born children of B get nothing. And they're just out of luck. It's called a rule of convenience. And obviously it is convenient to the existing children of B because now they can take the property and do whatever they want with it. They can borrow money on it. They can build things on it. They can develop it. They can operate it. And they don't have to worry about another child or more being born later who will have different ideas about what ought to be done with the property. To whom is it inconvenient? Well, it's very inconvenient to the later born children of B if there turn out to be any. Nevertheless, this is the standard rule. We close the class when we are ready to distribute possession and later born members of the class get nothing. The class closing rule is only a rule of construction. In other words, it applies only when there's no contrary intent expressed by the grantor. How could a contrary intent be expressed? Well, here's an example. To A for life, then to B's children, including children born to B after A dies. Here the grantor has expressly said that later born members of the class People who are born after the class gets possession are entitled to take their shares. That is certainly more inconvenient to the members of the class who exist at the time the class gets possession, but it's better for the later born children. But this only applies if the grantor expresses an intent for it to apply. Otherwise, we use the standard class closing rule and close the class when we give it possession of the land. If you ever create a class gift, be sure and state when the class is to close. You can do it either way. You ought to think about which way you want to do it. But instead of relying upon the common law presumption that we close the class when it gets possession, you ought to think about whether you want that to happen or not. And then you ought to say definitively one way or the other. Now, this is a great opportunity to review what we've learned about remainders. And it turns out we've studied four different categories of remainders. We're going to summarize them on this slide. The first category, the most simple category, is a remainder that's indefeasibly vested. It's one that is certain to vest fully in either the name taker or his or her successors. Let's look at the example, to A for life, then to B. We absolutely know for sure that when A dies, B will get possession of the land, or if B's already died, B's successors, B's usually heirs or devisees, will get possession. There's no question about the fact that the remainder will vest in B or B's successors. In the second category, the remainder is one that's subject to partial defeasance, and that's a class gift, what we studied earlier in this uh, video where there are people who might be added to the class at a later time. The classic example is to A for life and then to B's children. If we assume that B is alive and B has some children, then those children hold and own the remainder. But B might have more children and those additional children 
can also come in, become part of the class, and get their shares of the remainder, which means the shares of the earlier takers will be cut down proportionately in order that all of the children will have equal shares. That can, process can continue unless and until A dies, and then if B has additional children, according to the common law construction, they won't be entitled to join the class. We're going to close the class when we give it possession of the land. That's a presumption of the common law, but it can be changed by express wording of the grantor. So if the grantor wished to say so, even children born to be after A died would be entitled to join the class and take shares of the remainder. The third category is a remainder that's vested subject to complete defeasance, and the reason for that is that it's subject to a condition, but the condition is a condition subsequent rather than a condition precedent. Remember, a condition subsequent is one that might divest or defeat the remainder. We state the remainder, and then we say, but under certain circumstances, it won't take after all. Here's an example, to A for life, then to B, but if B has gotten divorced by the time A dies, to C instead. So you'll notice grammatically the language gives the gift to B, and then in a later clause says, but if something happens, B doesn't get it after all. So that's a classic condition subsequent. So B has a vested remainder subject to complete defeasance. The final category is a contingent remainder. Either it's contingent because it has a condition precedent or because the taker is unascertainable. Here are a couple of examples. To A for life, then to B if B is still married. Well, that's an if clause. It's part of the language giving the gift to B, and therefore it's a condition precedent, and that, that makes B's remainder a contingent remainder. The other example is one in which the taker is unascertainable. It says to A for life, then to A's first child to marry. Well, if we assume that none of A's children have gotten married yet, we can't tell which child will be the first to marry. Indeed, A might not have any children at all. But the point is that the taker is unascertainable. We cannot identify a person and say, you own the remainder, and that in and of itself will make the remainder a contingent remainder. If the previous slide seemed like a little too much information, here's a simplified version of it. There are four categories of remainders. Three are vested and one is contingent. The vested remainders are indefeasibly vested, vested subject to partial defeasance, that's the, the class gift, the one that's subject to open, and vested subject to complete defeasance, that's the one that's got a condition subsequent. So those are the four categories of remainders, good to remember on an exam. That completes our discussion of class gifts. The next video, video 11, is about springing and shifting executory interests. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. And thanks for watching.